Okay, 56 for our 10 through 12 year olds. You are now dismissed. Your leader, Jared, is there in the back. Parents, you can pick up your kids after service. Let's out at the Radiant Kids Ministry area. Uh, hey, I, you know, we, we take truth real seriously here. And so, Chris, I have to publicly correct you. It is not good to see frost in the morning when you wake up. We are praying for eternal sunshine and warmth. Hey, if you're new here this morning, we're so glad that you're here with us today. We would love to know that you were here. So in the seat box in front of you are some communication cards. We'd love to have you fill one of those out, and you can turn it in at Guest Central, which will be right in front of you as you exit the auditorium doors today. We have some people there with some name tags on that would love to be able to properly greet you, greet you answer any questions you might have about the church, a little gift bag for you. And then this week, you'll get an email from us just letting you know, uh, again, we're so glad you were here, and letting you know what some of the next steps are for you. If you want to know more about what Radiant Church is all about. Uh, also coming up the 27th, so just a couple weeks away, right after church lets out, we're having a new to Radiant meeting. And what that is, is we cater in some Qdoba, so you can like make your own little burrito, you know, queso, whatever nachos you want to do. And then we'll spend about an hour together where I will, um, yeah, as we eat, I will tell you a little bit of the vision and the values and the history of Radiant Church, what we're all about. You have a time to ask me any questions you might have. Also be able to tell you what some of the next steps are for you if you want to ingrate, or you know, become part of this family here. So it's a fun time, and if nothing else, you get some free Qdoba. So I encourage you, you can sign up for that at radiantA2.com under the events page. We would love to see you there. And then uh, also this week as our ushers get ready to receive the offering. Uh, if you're a parent with a young child, you might know, but we have new rooms for our kids. We ended up splitting up, so now we have an infant and a toddler room. And so uh, Jared and his team, and um, they just did a great job of getting our room ready. So now as we grow, I remember the days when we prayed for 10 kids. I'm like, we prayed for 10 kids. Like, we stood on that, like, God, just give us 10 children. It would be such a miracle. And, that's, and that was all of our kids. Like, they were there, and we still didn't have 10 kids. And now we pray, God, give us more rooms and more people on the team because you all have been fruitful and multiplied. So <laughs> you're great. You're fulfilling the Genesis mandate. Um, but thank you so much for your giving, your support, your serving, your praying. It is awesome to see what it is that Jesus is doing in Radiant Kids and be able to make more space and more rooms for them. Uh, we love partnering with parents and helping them instill faith, an unshakable faith in the hearts of their children. And I'm not going to make any assumptions. Like, we don't do it. You parents, you're awesome, and you're the ones who are instilling faith in your children. It is so uh, incredible, and we're so grateful that we have an hour and a half each week to be able to partner with you in that. So thank you for giving, serving, praying. Keep doing that, because we're excited about what Jesus is doing in Radiant Kids. So Jesus, as we give back to you, we're so grateful for how generous you have been with us. And Jesus, we think specifically of how you've answered our prayer for children. And Jesus, you're filling this church with young ones. And God, we pray that we would know how to steward them well, that you'd fill every parent with wisdom and how to train and equip their children to walk after you all the days of their life. God, we pray for an anointing over children in Radiant Church, that we would raise up a generation who's passionate about you, who's seeking after your presence. God, give your grace, your patience, your wisdom to every parent and over every child. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen and amen. Well, I also, also want to publicly acknowledge real quick, it's, uh, you know, we had Joy back with us today, if you're new here, uh, Joy was gone for a while. So it's awesome to have her back with us again today, and also I want to acknowledge Rama. Rama, you did such an incredible job of leading us. And she's like 12 years old, so it's really cool to see what Jesus is doing. But uh, we're just really blessed with what God's doing here, especially in the place of worship. And I'm so grateful for every worship leader that we have and every musician. Hey, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn this morning uh, to Luke chapter 4 and then also to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to spend a lot of time in Hebrews, but I want you to look at Luke chapter 4 as well. And we're continuing in our series called Fruitful. And the whole idea behind it is that all through Scripture, one of the things God's doing is he's talking about how we are like plants. That's the analogy that he's using, is that we're like a tree or we're like a plant. And what he wants for us is for us to be fruitful. And what fruitful means is that what your life is producing, that's the fruit of your life. And so if you're someone who is very patient, the fruit of your life is patience. It's what is being produced by the way that you live and what's going on in your heart. If you're someone who's very impatient, 
Like if you're driving down 94 or 23 rush hour, you might feel impatient. That is a fruit that your life is producing. But what Jesus says is there's fruit that he wants us to produce. Jesus said, it's my will that you be fruitful. That's God's desire for us, that we produce good and godly fruit in our life. And so we've been going through this series talking about how is it that we live a life that is producing the right kind of fruit. And this week, we're going to be talking about the right environment for fruitfulness. As every plant has an environment that it was designed and it was created to exist in so that it can be fruitful. Uh, my wife Anna, she loves orchids and not like the really lame orchids that grow naturally in Michigan. She loves the exotic ones that have no business being in our state. And so to, what we've done is we've taken a plant and we've removed it from its natural environment where it would naturally be fruitful all by itself. Orchids, you don't need to do anything to them in the wild. They just grow and they produce fruit. But when you bring that plant indoors, it is like darn near impossible for it to be fruitful. And so what we do is, you know, every week she has this watering routine that she does because if it was out in the wild, it's just going to be watered. When it's in the wrong environment, we have to make sure that we're watering it, not watering it too much because then we kill it. If we don't water it enough, we kill it. It's really hard to water these stupid flowers so that they can be fruitful. Then there's the light right requirement. You know in the wild where these orchids live, there's nobody that's getting out the sun lamp and positioning it out and getting out the, like, how many lumens have we got here, we're good. They're just created to live in that type of an environment. But now we have to make sure we're getting the right lighting. We have to fertilize them every week if we want them to be fruitful. In the wild, you don't need to fertilize the plants. They just grow in the right soil where they're receiving the nutrients that they need. So we've removed a plant from its natural habitat where it is naturally fruitful, and now we have to put lots of resources, lots of time, and lots of energy in trying to coax it to be fruitful because it's not in the right place. We also have children in our house. That is not the right environment for any orchid. <laughs> so what happens is we finally put all of this labor and all of this effort into getting these tiny little blooms, like these little buds, not even blooms yet, the buds to begin to appear that you wait nine months for. And then our kids see them and they're like, oh, what's this? Pluck it off, huh, pluck the next one off. And so we put all of this time and effort in and then they never ever bloom because our children pluck them off before it happens. Tons of time, energy, effort, and all we can do is just barely keep the plants alive. We never see them bloom. Why? Because it's not in the right environment. It's not where it was created to be. You know, the same thing's true for us, that for every one of us as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, that God has created and prepared an environment for you that you will be fruitful in, and it won't take all of the extra effort and labor. It just naturally, the result of your life is that you are going to produce fruit. It's going to be what happens. You know what that environment is? Where you will be fruitful, where you will grow, you will become established, you will be healthy? It's the local church. My wife is the only person. <laughs> the pastor's wife is the only Because here's, like, everybody, I was watching the room, and everybody's like, like tell me, like, I gotta know this secret, so I'm gonna be fruitful. And I say, the local church, and everybody's like, oh, gosh. You all looked disappointed and let down. <laughs> Except for my wife. Woo! That's because she has to do that. I pay her. No. <laughs> Here's, you know why you all don't get excited about that? It's because you, what you have done is you have been in church for a long time, a lot of you, and some of you that are new to your church, or maybe this is the first time you've been in a church, you have a lot of perceptions about what the church is. A lot of you, have you, I know this is probably none of you, have any of you ever experienced any form of disappointment or hurt in the church? <laughs> yeah. And so what happens is we don't get excited. The church is irrelevant. The church is hurtful. It's a bunch of hypocrites. It's messed up. Blah, blah, blah. We go through all these things. And so we don't get excited about the local church. And I, that's really a strategic thing that the enemy is doing inside of the church. Because here's what the enemy does. Is that he comes in and he doesn't create anything. He comes in and he perverts things. Everything that God creates to be good, the enemy comes in and he tries to pervert it. And that word pervert means to alter something from its original course, meaning, or state to a distortion or corruption of what was first intended. 
So what the enemy does is he takes what God's created to be good, he's created to be a healthy place for you, and it's not just the church, it's marriage, it's sexuality, it's you know, forgiveness, it's the environment, like literally everything has been affected by sin, and the enemy comes in and he perverts it, he tries to alter it from its intended course so that it's something very different, and it becomes a place where instead of there being great blessing and health and life for you, and that you get excited like my wife, woo! it makes it into a place of where her it causes you to want to pull away from it, or you buy into a wrong idea, a perverted idea of what something really is. But here's the beautiful thing about the church, is that it might be a place of where there, you have experienced unforgiveness, it might be a place of where you have been uh, you know, deeply wounded, where people have gossiped, where people have you know, been judgmental, unforgiving, people haven't been welcoming to you. That's a part of what it means to be in a church that the enemy is attacking and is continually trying to pervert. And our church is no different. Every church I've ever been in, I have been hurt in, and I have hurt other people in. This church will not be everything that God created it to be until Jesus returns and fully puts away the enemy and all of his works and we receive the full restoration of our hearts and our minds that Jesus has coming for us. Until that day, this church is going to be led by an imperfect pastor who continues to struggle and have fears and insecurities and not being considered at times. I'm gonna, I will confess that right up here on stage, of that I will continue to do things wrong and improperly. I'm not trying to, but I understand the reality of what it means to be human. Every staff member I have will continue to hurt people and will continue to let you down, will continue to fail to walk out perfectly what God's meant us to be. Every leader, every person serving in this church will continue to do these things. And every person that is sitting in every seat will continue to do the same thing as well. Aren't you? That's like that's my pitch. Come to Radiant Church. <laughs> but you know what the good thing is about that? Here's the silver lining. It means that if you're an imperfect person who's still struggling to follow Jesus perfectly, you found your people. Like, we're here. You're one of us. And one of the most beautiful things about the church is that we're messed up people who hurt each other, were inconsiderate. Okay, I mean, we, we look at the New Testament church, it's messed up. There's sexual sin, there's racism, there's class warfare going on. I mean, there is messed up stuff in the earliest church that we look at. But still, in the church, Jesus is gracing us and he's calling us to be more like him. And he's given us the ability to forgive each other. He's giving us the ability to accept each other. He's giving us the ability to put the needs of other people above our own. He's given us the ability to ask for forgiveness and to receive forgiveness from each other. He's teaching us how to love each other in the local church. And you won't find that anywhere else. And Jesus is coming and he's restoring the church. It says that we are his bride and he's, he's purifying us. He's, he's, it says that he's removing every blemish from us, that he's making us into a radiant church. That's not, that's branding. That's what Jesus says about the church is that he's making us into a radiant church. And every one of us is in that journey. We're on that process of learning how to be the radiant church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ, who's able to live with great grace and love and mercy and forgiveness for each other and is able to overcome all of the obstacles and all of the perversion that the enemy is going to bring to us. Like, listen, I love the local church. I love it. There's this really spiritual sounding saying that a lot of people you know, always say like, you know what, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Doesn't that sound kind of spiritual? Like, oh yeah, yeah, no. So if you came up to me and said, Jeremy, I love you, but I hate your wife. Guess what? I don't feel real loved at that moment. <laughs> Listen, we don't, Jesus says, the church is my bride. So if you say, I love Jesus, but I hate his bride, yeah. Now, my wife isn't perfect. I know that more than anybody. But you better not hate her. <laughs> like, there will be no place for you in Radiant Church if you hate my wife. I'm just throwing that out there. You will not have an intimate, deep relationship with me if you tell me all the time that you hate my wife. You will not have a deep and intimate relationship with Jesus if you're always talking about how much you hate his wife. Listen, the church is messed up. I know that more than anybody. But it's the bride of Jesus Christ. 
And he loves the church. He's passionate about the church. He laid himself down for the church. And I am so grateful that he has drawn us in to being a part of his church, his body, his family. As imperfect as it is, we're going to go through the process of letting Jesus build us into a church as radiant church that continues to become more like Jesus. We're going to become more and more that environment where we flourish and where we grow and where we prosper and we are fruitful in everything we do. As we walk it out imperfectly, it is still the environment that Jesus has created for every single one of us as believers to live and to exist and to be fruitful in. Hey, listen, being in the environment of the church is so important for your fruitfulness that even Jesus did it. Jesus is God, and he goes to church every week. This is what it says, Luke 4, 16. So you know I'm not just making this stuff up. It says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So he goes back to his hometown. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. So what this is telling us is that even Jesus, even God in human flesh, recognizes that it's so important for his life and ministry if he's going to be fruitful because he comes and he limits himself to live in the human, uh, in the human way where he has to be obedient to the Father. He's limited his power and all of these other things. He knows that if he wants to be fruitful in the ministry that God's called him to, that his Father has given him, he has to be a part of the local church. And not just occasionally, it says, as was his custom, he went to church. You know the average American that goes to church attends once a month? 12 times a year. 12 times a year we're getting in the environment of where we're able to receive the nutrients and the water and the strength and the growth and the support and the encouragement that we need to be fruitful. That is not the way that God created you to exist. You will not flourish. You will not be able to live out all of the things that God's called you to if being a part of the local church on a regular basis is a part of your life. Listen, it's so important that Jesus with his disciples, what does he do? He's taking them to church with him. A part of what the disciples learned to do was to go to church on a regular basis because that was the environment that they needed to live in after Jesus is gone so that they can continue to live a life that is fruitful. And if you think your church is messed up, if you keep reading in this story in Luke chapter 4, you know what happens after Jesus goes to his hometown church and stands up to read? They get so mad at him that they take him to a cliff and try to throw him off a cliff to kill him. We are yet to try to kill Jesus in Radiant Church, I am proud to say. So like our church is messed up, but it's not as messed up as the church Jesus went to. If Jesus can go to a really messed up church, then guess what? Like, we can too. And if we're going to live as disciples of Jesus Christ, then we need to follow the pattern of Jesus Christ just like his disciples did. You know, the, the book of Acts records what the earliest church looks like. And it says this in Acts chapter 2. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see what it says there? In this incredibly fruitful church, where thousands of people are coming to faith in Jesus and are being added to the family, it says that they're getting together in the temple courts. How often? Daily. People are like, I want, I want to be a part of an Acts kind of church. You want to go to church every day? No, no, gosh, no. No, like that's, I just want to be a part of an Acts church that like, you know, doesn't do that, but all of the miracles, I want that, just don't want to have to go to church. Like it doesn't work that way. The disciples and the early followers of Jesus who had seen the miracles, who had the Holy Spirit fall on them, they were so pumped up, they so recognized the connection between their fruitfulness and ministry and then the life God had called them to and being a part of the local church that every day they're getting together to publicly worship and pray and study scripture together, not individually, but together. They're going after Jesus. Why do so few people in our city, less than 5% of the people in our city attend church? Like why, does that ever boggle your mind? I'm from the west side of the state. That's where I grew up, where pretty much everybody goes to church. You don't live like you go to church, but you go to church on Sunday. I move over here, and everybody hates church. I remember one year I, invite, I invited 30-something people to come to Easter service because they say statistically 85% of people you invite to come to you to church on Easter will go with you. Not a one of them came. Most of them were offended that I like, went to a church and they didn't like me anymore. I was like, well... Oh. People don't like church in our city. But I would say this, a big part of the reason why people don't value church and gathering together is because we as the church don't value it. 
why would anybody outside of the faith get excited about church when the people inside of the faith don't get excited about church or prioritize it in their life? Listen, Satan is strategic. He knows what he's doing. He knows that if you, and it's not the only thing you have to do, but it is a requirement, I believe, for us. If we want to be fruitful, that we have to exist in the right environment. Otherwise, we're trying to artificially water. We're trying to artificially receive nutrients. We're putting all this time and effort into just keeping our faith alive so that we're not actually ever to be fruitful. And I see so many people who are living fruitless lives. Their faith is alive, but so much struggle is going into just keeping the faith alive and following after Jesus when they could be fruitful if they were just in the right environment. It would be the overflow, the natural thing that's happening inside of them. So we need, if we want to be fruitful, to be in the environment of the local church. Jesus did it. The disciples did it. The early followers of Jesus, they all did it. And The reason for that is really made clear to us in the book of Hebrews, and this isn't exhaustive. I don't have exhaustive knowledge, so nothing I ever teach will be exhaustive, and also I have time limits. This whole sermon was supposed to be point one of my sermon, and I realized that I made a big mistake. So Hebrews chapter 10, this is the author's writing, and he says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts spring clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together is as a habit of some. Ooh. Dramatic pause. <laughs> but it's not you guys because you're all in church. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, is no long, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Like that got fiery at the end. Literally, it got fiery at the end of that passage. But here's what's happened. The church, like we, we started following Jesus, like, woo, like we're gonna get together in church every day, everything's awesome, and we're seeing miracles, and I'm growing in my faith. But what happens is like everything else, you know, your kids have soccer games, and you had a long week at work, and like it's frosty out, so I wanna go enjoy that. And all of these distractions, and all of these other temptations come up that start making it, so instead of being a part of the regular church gathering, Instead of prioritizing being in the environment of the local church where you can be fed and you can be fruitful, they start removing themselves from that. And they're becoming fruitless. And the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, don't do that. Re-up on being a part of the local church. Don't neglect getting together because it's so vital to our faith. Here's what happens when we prioritize coming together as a local church. We encounter the presence of God. That's the first one right there that he starts talking about. And you might have missed it because it was this really long passage. But the author is saying that he's talking about the curtain being torn and there's the veil and there's the holy place and all that stuff. What he's doing is he's talking about the presence of God. Uh, For the people who are reading this with the Jewish background, they understand that in the temple, there was the outer courts where everybody got together. There's the holy of holy where the priest could go into. And then there was the holy of holies. And there was this really thick veil that kept anybody from going into the Holy of Holies because that was where the actual tangible presence of God rested on the face of the earth. God, his presence, he's everywhere, but he was like extra there. And so there's this place, but there's this thick veil that keeps us from it because of our sinfulness. Our sinfulness in the presence of the Holy God is very bad for us. It destroys us. And so only once a year, the high priest could go in before the presence of God after having made the right sacrifices. He'd go in there and he'd sprinkle blood from a sacrifice on the altar of the Lord to get like the covering of the sins, the atoning of the sins of the people of God for the entire year. And then he'd go back out. One person, once a year, for just this brief moment, got to go in and experience the goodness and the glory and the presence of God. 
When Jesus died on the cross, having taken the sins of the world upon himself, and through his death, bearing the penalty for sin on himself, it says that when he died, there was an earthquake, and the veil was torn in two. That veil that separated us from God because of our sinfulness and our rebellion against him, it was torn in two so that we now have access, as the author of Hebrews and we have a bold confidence knowing that we can become before the throne of grace. When we come together as the church, we encounter the presence of God in a miraculous way. You can encounter the presence of God every moment of your life, and you should. What we do is we learn to host the presence of God everywhere we go. When you go home and you're parenting, you learn to host the presence of God in the midst of all of the goldfish and chicken nuggets on your minivan floor, and the people are writing on the walls, like I'm learning to host the presence of God. You moms that are sleepless at night because you're nursing and changing diapers, you can learn to host the presence of God. He is there with you in the midst of that. For those of you that are at your workplace, you take the presence of God with you. With you and you learn to host him there in everything you do. We are always hosting. We are always marked by the presence of God. But when we come together as the local church, there's this increase, a manifestational increase of the presence of God that we experience. Because you are never meant to primarily experience God individually. It's corporately. When you read all through scripture, the way that God's encountered his people isn't just one-on-one-on-one-on-one on one on one on one with everybody. It's this corporate gathering where there's the great manifestations of his presence. We were designed together to seek after God and together encounter his presence. And so I encountered Jesus in great ways on my own, but the primary way that I just am blown away by the presence of God is when we gather here together and together we worship him and we seek after him. When you come into that place, the environment of coming into the local church, what we're doing is we are creating a place of where heaven meets earth. And where the presence of God is, there's freedom. Where the presence of God is, lives are transformed and changed. Where the presence of God is, you're encouraged and hope and faith are built up inside of you. We need to come to church, it says, because this is the place where we are going to encounter the presence of God. Secondly, it says that we stir each other up to love and good works. When we come together as the church, what we are doing is it says that we are stirring each other up. And that word to stir each other up, it actually means like to provoke. And to provoke means an emotional response that leads to action. That when we come together, what we are doing is we are provoking each other, creating emotional responses in each other that moves us into action. There's a difference between being provoked and jealous. It used to be when I'd see someone that God had really done something miraculous in, especially other pastors or seen revivals in other cities and you know, prayer meetings that were on fire, I used to get jealous. Like, God, why won't you do that for me? Why won't you do that here? I was like, you know, 13-year-old Jeremy, like, ah. <laughs> Don't understand me and run to my room. Now I'm provoked. Now when I see what God is doing in other places and other churches, I'm like, God, why not here? God, I want you to do that here. God, I want us to be on fire. God, I want revival inside of my city, and I know that you can do it, so God, now I'm going to come after you. I'm provoked. There's an emotional response to me that's now spurring me on to action of seeking God for our city in the way that I see him doing it in other places. That's what we're doing in each other. We're provoking each other to do, uh, it says two things, to love, and that word love, it's, it means agape, which is a strong non-sexual affection uh, with a regard for the other person as being greater than yourself and is characterized by a willingness to sacrifice or to give of yourself for the well-being of someone else. It says that we provoke each other to love, to view others as greater than ourselves, to love them and to demonstrate love for them in sacrificial ways because when we start being provoked to love, you know what the natural response is? Is good works. When you are provoked to love someone, it leads you to do things on their behalf. So, for example, one of the things we do is the big give last year. It was incredible. Y'all gave $30,000 because we looked at these kids who were going to school in flip-flops and without pants, without winter coats, and we stirred each other up to love them and say, God, like our hearts are for these kids. God, they, and that love that we had for them that makes us want to be sacrificial towards them stirred us up to then do good works of where we gave sacrificially. We all could have, you know, spent $30,000 on ourselves. There's a million things that we could, uh, 
We could spend $30,000 fast without thinking about it. The money that you all gave last year for that, you, that could have gone to so many other things. But you were stirred up to love, and that love led to an expression through giving, of putting their need or their desire above what it was that you wanted for yourself. And so we went in there and we gave them coats and we got boots for them and we had snacks and we got food for them so they can take food home so they're not hungry. Like we did all of these incredible things. But you know that would not have happened if you had not been a part of the local church? If you had not been a part of this local church, if we hadn't been gathering together, encountering the presence of God, we would not have been in the right environment. We would not have had the fruit of love that led to good works stirred up inside of us if we were not a part of the local church. This is the environment that leads to that kind of thing inside of our city. And we're doing it again this year, and I'm excited about it, and we're going to do it bigger, and we're going to do it better, and we're going to provoke each other to love and to good works. When you are provoked to love, the good works will naturally follow you. One of the things that you need to have in your life to be fruitful is the environment where others are provoking you, not causing jealousy in your heart, but provoking you to love and to do good works. And then this is the last thing that he says. He says, we overcome sin. Maybe you haven't thought about that before. Part of what happens when we are in the environment of the local church is that we are able to overcome sin. There is a connection between being in the environment of the church and being able to overcome sin inside of your life. And there is a connection between not being a regular part of a church and having sin dominate your life. I see this over and over again. As people are coming to church, because what happens, you come to church and you encounter the presence of God. Uh, the presence of God, when there's areas of sin in your life that he's revealing to you, and we all have those, there's things that we were doing, we had no idea it was even sin. But the Holy Spirit's taking us on this process of sanctification, of making us more like him and dealing with the areas of our heart that aren't aligned with him. So he's continually, when we come into the local church, there's a conviction that comes over us. Not a condemnation, not a guilt, not a shame, but there's conviction that the Holy Spirit gives you about the sin areas in your life that he's working on and wanting to lead you into freedom and health and restoration. In. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a guy. So like 99.99999% of every other young man, sexual sin was something that I struggled with. You know how I was able to overcome that and continue to live a life of overcoming it? It's because I'm a part of the local church. And every week I'm positioning myself in a place where if I have been not up, up, holding to that standard that God has called me to, I come into the local church and his presence convicts me of that and makes us that I'm now stirred up again to go after that life of freedom and holiness that he has called me to. I see that when people get involved in the local church and you start seeing the sin issues in their life, that God's changing and he's breaking free and it might be gossip, it might be unforgiveness, it might be you know, anger, it might be, uh, there's like a zillion things I could list on and on forever. We all have those different areas in our life of sin that we struggle with, and when we come into this environment, there's the ability to overcome those sins. This is what I see when people check out from the local church. They get out of that place where they're convicted of their sin. They get into an environment where their sin is celebrated. You ever notice that nobody outside of the church is trying to help you overcome sin? They're all trying to help you sin even more and find new, more creative ways to sin. That's what we do for each other outside of the local church. If you just put yourself in the environment of where people are encouraging you to sin and supporting and affirming you in sin, guess what? You're in the right environment to sin. And I see this happen again and again. And when someone I know is like they check out a church, and then like months later, they come back, like, man, I've been struggling with blah, 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 and all these other things. I'm like, yeah, no wonder. You got out of the presence of God. You neglected the gathering together of where you live in the area where you're able to find freedom and to be able to live in that freedom. You've been just trying to maintain faith. This is what the, the writer says. It says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. What it's saying is that when we get outside of the environment of the local church and we start to be overcome by sin, it says that there's no longer a sacrifice for our sins. And the reason for that is because we knew the truth. 
we knew the Holy Spirit revealed to us the area that we needed to repent in in our life. And we got to the place where we said, I don't care. I'm just going to keep on doing this. I don't care what it is that God's telling me. I don't care where the Holy Spirit's trying to lead me. I'm just going to do what it is that I want to do. And what you've done is you said, Jesus, you aren't Lord. I am. Like, this is serious stuff. Nobody ever thinks, yeah, I'm just going to stop going to church and thinks that their faith is going to end up being destroyed someday. And then they get a position of where Jesus is no longer the Lord of their life. Nobody thinks that. The devil doesn't tell you that's what he's trying to do in your life. He just says, ah, like, you don't have to go to church. Like, it's not that important. It's just full of hypocrites anyways. It is full of hypocrites. That's one of my favorite things about the church. <laughs> we don't have these false pretenses we have to try to uphold. We can be real with each other. But when the Satan will just continue to try to distract us, keep trying to pull us away. You all have felt that. I know that you felt that. I felt that. Contend for it. Stay committed to the environment of the local church. It is vital to your fruitfulness in life. I'll go so far as to say this. Every person I have ever met that is fruitful is, has a regular habit of being in the environment of the local church. I'm not saying that you can't be a Christian and not be in the local church. I am by no means saying that. Thief on the cross, he never gets to go to church. He's in heaven. Because our, our salvation isn't through attendance. Our salvation is through faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. But you can live a life following after Jesus with your faith, but never allowing it to lead to fruit in your life where you're just spending all of your time and all of your effort just keeping faith alive instead of being fruitful. Listen, God still loves you. He's not judging you for that. He's not trying to condemn you about that, but he's calling you to something more. You were called to live a life of significance in the kingdom. You were called to live a life of fruitfulness. But that won't happen if you aren't part of the local church. I remember when I was living in Tennessee and I was trying to make it as a musician. And... Uh, you know, like, God, this is my ministry you've called me to. And, you know, we were doing our shows and stuff. And, like, you know, doing, we did altar calls and people were getting saved at shows. Like, thank you, Jesus loves you. Good night. And, and then, like, on to the next city. You know, like, riding unicycles. I was blowing fireballs and stuff, doing backflips off drum risers. It was a blast. Like, what young guy in their 20s does not want to be a part of that? And there was some fruit that was a part of it. And then I remember as I was just like really pouring into scripture and really going after God had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's just this new love and desire awoke in me to want to live my life. I recognize, I had that moment, like lots of people when they get uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, they're like, you know, different kinds of experiences. Like mine was this recognition of how short my life is. And I have this one short life that I get to live on this earth. And the priority became Jesus. And so I started to really evaluate, God, what is it that you want me to do with this one short life that you have given me so that I can give back to you? God, I'll do anything that you want me to do. Like, I'll, I'll move to Antarctica. I will be a missionary to the penguins. Like, <laughs> I was sold out for Jesus. <laughs> and as I was evaluating all of the opportunities and everything that I could do, you know what Jesus spoke to me about? was to commit myself to the local church. I was like, what? Jesus, like, I want to reach the nations. I want to be fruitful. I want, you know, like, I want to do something in the kingdom. And he told me, and this is what he said. He said, the best environment to be a disciple and to make disciples is the local church. It is the most fertile soil for that. See, what I've been trying to do was just go out and to make disciples and, you know, like, make, have them go to that place of decision and then, like, catch you later. Hope everything works out. That was just throwing seed into who knows what. The Lord convicted me. He said, you need to still go out and you need to do things, but you need to be bringing people in to the local church because that's where disciples are going to be made. That's where lifelong change is going to happen. That's where brothers and sisters and mother and fathers are going to come alongside people and put their arms around them and help encourage them, encounter God, stir them up to love and to good works. 
And so that's what I did. I committed myself to local church and I actually made a deal with God. And I said, God, I'm, I don't know what I can do in the local church, but I'll be committed to it. And so I was you know, a musician in the local church and it seemed like a big step backwards to me. And then as I was faithful there and other things happened and then I'm you know, leading worship and it's like, God, I definitely should not be doing this, but it seems like this is what you want me to do right now, so I'll do it until I don't have to do it anymore. I was setting up chairs in the local church. I was cleaning bathrooms in the local church. What I was doing is I was going out and instead of just trying to like, you know, tell people about Jesus and hope everything works out great, like I was pulling them in. I was here, I was getting encouraged, I was being stirred up, I was being provoked, I was encountering Jesus, and then going back out as someone who had been provoked to love and to do good works outside of the church, and then bring the people back into the family of God. And inside of the church, put them in the place where they're encountering him week after week after week, and they're being provoked, they're being led to a life of righteousness, they're overcoming sin issues, all of these different things. I became an addict for the local church. I love it when we gather together because over the, gosh, I don't know how many years it's been, like the 16 years since I, 18 years since I made that decision to commit myself to the local church, there has been a fruitfulness in my life that would not have existed if I had continued to just try to live my life outside of the local church. You want to live a life of fruit? You have to be a part of the local church. It is the environment that God has created for us. Until he returns, this is the environment where we grow, where we're nourished, and where we're able to be fruitful. Outside of the local church, you can maintain faith, but you will not be fruitful. And the reason I say this, like, it breaks my heart because... I see young people that come into church, make a decision to follow Jesus, and they just kind of get busy with life and end up falling away. And some of them end up walking away from faith. Some of them just live a life of just struggling, trying to keep their head above water. That's not what God created for you. He wants you to be fruitful. He wants to use you to impact your generation. He wants godly fruit to be born through you. The only way, though, is to remain here. Not just here, but like in the church, wherever it is that God has you. I see parents who enter into that stage of life. Now you've got kids, and they're crazy, and they never sleep, and they want to play every sport that's ever been created, the ones that are cool and the ones that you really hate, but you support them. And so like, it draws you away from church. The working on weekends, it draws you away from church. Like All of these things and priorities that come up, and you're frazzled, and you're worn out, and you deprioritize gathering together. This is the thing that you need the most in that frazzled, hurried, just destroyed place of life. But Satan wants to deceive you and make you make it so that you are actually disconnected from the thing that you need most so that you can live a life of fruit. And maybe the thing that breaks my heart the most is when I see the generation that's before me and they've seen God do amazing things, they've seen the miracles, they've seen the moves of God and they live fruitful lives, but then something happens, they kind of get disappointed or, you know, our music's too loud, it's not what it used to be or we do things different now in this generation. And the people that have the most wisdom and the most ability to provoke us and to stir us up, they check out. And it doesn't just affect your fruitfulness in your life, it affects all the rest of us. When the most mature believers check out from the church, the whole church suffers mightily. Listen, if you're in that generation, we need you. We desperately need you. You're like the cloud of witnesses that we get to have right here on earth of God's faithfulness and how to live a life following after him. Keep coming. Put up with our music. Put up with our skinny jeans. Put up with everything else that you think is stupid. But we honor you. We celebrate you. We thank God for you. Continue to live a life that is fruitful. And for all of you, yeah. And for all of you who are going through that temptation, it will happen. It, right, maybe right now you're in the season where you've been like kind of in and out. Jesus is calling you to be in. You need to be in. And there will come times in your life, even if you're like passionate on fire, I love the local church, like my wife, there will come times. <laughs> life gets busy. Disappointment comes along. Someone hurts you or offends you. Pastor preaches something you don't like. It's going to start making you, start to pull back. The enemy's going to come in. He's going to try to pervert. He's going to try to alter. He's going to try to change. 
Because his whole goal is, if you can't destroy your faith, it's to destroy your fruitfulness. I love the local church. It's warts, it's wrinkles, it's hypocrites, all of it. I love the local church. And my life has been fruitful because I've been a part of the local church and my life will continue to be fruitful because I will always remain committed to the local church. People ask me at times, what are you going to do when you retire? Like, I'm going to be at the pastor that goes and prays with you at the hospital. or something. I don't know, I'm going to keep serving. As long as there's breath in my lungs, I'm going to be using that breath for Jesus and for serving and ministering to others. And I can't even dream of the horrors of what music will be like 40, 50 years from now. <laughs> but I'm committed to the local church and to worshiping Jesus with horrible music, if that's what it is, because it's not about the music. I don't know if it'll be really loud or really quiet. I don't care. I'm going to be committed to worshiping Jesus. I don't care what they wear. I, don't, I just want to be in the environment where I can be fruitful. And that's what God's calling us to as a church. Would you stand with me this morning? Holy Spirit, we're so grateful that we get to encounter you. Would you minister to our hearts in this moment? So I know there's some of you that are here. There's been very real wounds and hurts and disappointments. And the enemy has been using that to try to keep you from fully engaging in the environment of the local church. This morning, could you forgive whoever that was? Can you extend to them the same kind of grace and mercy and love that you have received from Jesus? This morning, if your priorities have been wrong and you've allowed life and the pressures of it, careers, hobbies, tiredness, to keep you from really being committed to the environment where you can be fruitful. The enemy has been deceiving you. This morning is your act of faith. Would you recommit to the bride of Christ? To putting yourself in the place of where you can encounter the presence of God. Where you can be stirred up to love and to good works putting yourself in the place of where you're able to overcome sin and walk in freedom. Jesus, thank you for the local church. Thank you that you included me in it. Jesus, we pray your blessing over Radiant Church. God, thank you for it. God, we thank you for every church inside of our city. Oh, Jesus, would you do reviving inside of all of us? In every church, God, would you work revival in our hearts? Oh, Jesus, we pray that this would be the place of where we encounter you, the living God. Jesus, move us to faith. Provoke us to have expectation that when we gather together, we are going to encounter you. God, let this be the place where your presence dwells, where your presence rests over this house, and that every time we gather together, we have a faith and an expectation that we're going to encounter you, your presence among us, that you're going to be in our midst. God, stir that up inside of us, and then come and meet us at that place of expectation, week after week after week, ever-increasing levels of your presence as we gather together. And Jesus over Radiant Church, would this be a provoking church that we provoke each other to love and to good works? 
We're just getting started in the way that we're going to love and to serve our city. God, move on our hearts that the natural overflow of our hearts is to love each other, to demonstrate, to give up rights and privileges and resources and time and energies and effort to serve and to love other people, the natural overflow of our life. And Jesus, would this be a house of freedom? where every chain of bondage, every sin is overcome as we gather together and we receive that precious and sweet correction from you. Jesus, over every generation, over our children, that foundation of loving the church and being a part of it. God, for every person in college, God, every student, as they have so much, God, that, that love for the local church and that recognition of their need to be a part of it and to come and to be nursed and encouraged. God, over every person, their 20s and 30s, God, over parents and professionals, Jesus, just that conviction and that draw to coming back every week to jump in the river of your peace and of your joy, of your love overflowing onto them. Jesus, this is a house of encouragement. Let that be. Radiant Church is a house of encouragement where we come in and we're moved by you. We're empowered, we're trained, we're equipped, and we go out fruitful, much fruit being born inside of our city, Jesus, and our generation, bringing them back into this house where they're made disciples of Jesus. Teach us to be the church you've called us to be. Wash us with your word. Purify us. Renew us. Make us into a radiant church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Excited about the church? Yeah. If you're not excited about this church, we believe in the kingdom. We're not trying to build the radiant kingdom. We are building the kingdom of Jesus Christ. If you're like, I want a church I love, I'm not kicking you out, but go find that church. Like, find that church where you can be plugged in and planted and where you can be fruitful and where you can say, you're not going to be excited every week, but, you know, where you're excited about going to church, you're excited about the vision and serving it and supporting it and going after it. We want thousands of people to be a part of this church. But if you hate this church, that's cool. There's a lot of churches. There's great churches. Go check out Grace. Go check out 242. Go check out, you know, all the other ones. Like, just be a part of the church somewhere. Find a church that you get plugged into and you love and you gather together and you're stirred up and you encounter Jesus and you provoke each other and you're convicted of sin and you overcome it. It's that important. We need you to be fruitful. I'm going to call my prayer partners forward. If there's anything that we can pray with you about, come, let us pray with you. We see Jesus move miraculously every single week in response to the prayers of his people. Uh, if you want to come hear more about Radiant Church, sign up for that out at Guest Central or RadiantA2.com for the 27th to eat lunch with us and know more about the church and our heartbeat. And then also, our groups have kicked off, and I'm hearing really good reports of what Jesus is doing in them. And so I can't encourage you enough. If you sign up for a group, you haven't gone yet, go to your group. They're waiting for you. They're waiting with open. They got, they got the ring and the robe and the fatted calf. They're ready for you. I'm just joking. <laughs> if you're not in a group, get in a group. It's so important to have some people that know you and love you and you're contending together for each other and you're studying scripture together. It is so important for you. Uh, get signed up for that again at radiant82.com or go to Guest Central. We can help you find a group that works for you. God bless. We love you. We love Radiant Church. We're so glad that you are here and we will see you next week.